Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Black Mental Health Matters podcast. My name is Trinity Thompson. I am a 2021 graduate of Spelman College. I'm super excited to be here. I actually majored in psychology with a concentration in mental health disorder. And today we're going to be talking about the overdiagnosis of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder in the Black community. And today we have our lovely guest, Dr. Camille Adams-Jones with us. So if you want to introduce yourself really quick, um, Dr. Adams-Jones. Good morning, good morning, and good day, good day, good day, good people. I am Dr. Camille Adams-Jones, best known to you guys as Miss Doc Jones. It's a joy to be here because I am the epitome of promoting hosting the necessary and needed conversations. And this just happens to be a, bi- a backdrop conversation that we rarely pour into. These are the things we run from, the conversations we don't have, the things we want to be dismissive of. But in the Black community, these are also the things that are tearing us down, tearing us ab- apart, and stalling us because we are failing to do just a few things to jumpstart ourselves to bidding in a place of betterment, and wellness. So thanks so much for having me, Trinity, and shout out to Spelman College. And all my- Thank you for being here. Um, so tell me first, like a little bit about like what you do, like what is your area of expertise? So I, I um, come from the, I hail from the field of social work, uh, um, clinical social workers out here and about, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, my voice. I'm a, um, I'm a mom. So that's what I've been doing this <laughs> week. That school has jumped in and I'm just getting my voice back. But um, I'm a native New Yorker. I'm currently residing in the D.C. area, and I began my studies at the University of Maryland at College Park, where I, too, majored in industrial psych and criminology. I went on from there to get my master's in social work from the University of Maryland, then went on and got my doctorate from the University of Southern California um, in social work as well. And I um, licensed clinician, and then what I've done is I've just padlocked my Mm -hmm. resume with everything that I feel is important to bring about wellness. So I have certificates and everything, certificates and um, play therapy. I'm a certified play therapist. I am a um, a trauma, a certified trauma specialist interventionist. I work on a lot of crit- critical incident and stress debriefings from an organizational side of the house. I um, mean, I do a lot of things with workplace wellness because I don't think we realize how much of our time we spend at work. On a normal work day, it's eight hours a day. Not this like remote work, which is really more like a 10 to 12 hour span of work days, but that's where the majority we spend our time is. And that's really where a lot of our mental health absorption takes place. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I I work with a lot of specialists. I came from the substance abuse community. That's where I got my war wounds in the fields of mental health. And there were so many people, particularly those from from the black community, misdiagnosed with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, mood disorder, conduct behavior disorders, when there's an overdiagnosis of that, when there's other stimuli going on. And a lot of that I found was generational. And I know we're going to uncover all of that. So when I, got into this field, when I got into this field, it was because I had a passion for wellness mm-hmm. and for people doing better. Like I said, I'm a native New Yorker, but I come from Southern folks. Like my mom's from North Carolina, my father's from South Carolina. And then if you've ever met a people that can cloak mental health in something, it's them Southern folks. They yeah, got- absolutely. My family comes from South Carolina. I know. Mm-hmm. A Bible scripture, if that can't cure, you know, they got a, a home cooked meal to give you a little hypertension to take your mind <laughs> off of the fact that you're depressed things like that. And we would love, and then the old fashioned um, African-American remedy that thank you, you cures everything, ginger ale. But I'm telling you, it takes true treatment and intentional engagement to really make yourself well. How about you, Trinity? Tell me a little bit about your background. What made you want to enter this field of psychology, especially during the time period in which you did? Yes. So actually, um, my first, I did not start off as a psych major. I actually started off as a bio major and I wanted to be a plastic surgeon. And when I took my first bio class in college and I ended up feeling my first exam with a 47, something just told me, you know what? My heart is not even really in this. Um, I was really just motivated by the money and I was kind of hoping to figure out what my true passion was as far as like a career and what I wanted to do with my life. Um, you know, something that would like actually give me something that would like fulfill me and give me purpose. And I wanted to find that a little bit quicker because I, you know, going to Spelman College, you know, each, each uh, semester is a little expensive. So I wanted to find out, uh, you know, a little bit um, 
more quickly um, and without having to leave school and make that decision. Um, that was just my personal belief um, that I wanted to find that out quickly. And I ended up switching to psychology and I just fell completely in love with the classes I was taking. That's so, I love that transparency. And let me tell you something. Yeah. You saved yourself from being one of the studies that we're about to talk about today. Like, yes. I have so many clients yeah. that are in med school that are there for we do the reasons of generational pressure. Mm -hmm. um, it, reasons feeling like this is what they were told they always needed to do, but they have no love for it. They're not dedicated to it. And let me tell you about the money. You don't get to spend it. You don't get to spend it. It's collecting because you're there for 18 to 24 to 27 hours of the day. There's not even 27 hours in the day, but you're there. Doing yes, that. exactly. And, and just to be transparent, I started out as a lawyer. I was in criminology component. I wanted to be a forensic um, mm -hmm. a forensic specialist. And I wanted to work with going to law school. And I went. Yeah. But I, that was just not my tribe. I didn't understand why people were running through, ripping the pages out of the book. And then I met with my advisor. She was like, before you give us another hundred grand, is this really where you want to be? I looked That's out true. the window and there was this school of social work. She's like, you sound like you want to help people. You want to do maybe the nonprofit thing and all that. I'm like, yes, but I, I like my Gucci bags. <laughs> and she was like, you got to figure out a way to elevate. So there's, yeah. And there's so many people that enter into this schizophrenia, bipolar, mental health conundrum mm -hmm. because they're driven by myths. They're driven by falsehoods. They never really had an understanding of their best authentic, authentic selves. Right. And, which, and, and, and so it's just this pet pressure that's coming from all directions. Pressures to be doctors, pressures to be attorneys, pressures to have wealth, pressures to build up, pressures to be this, um, to conform, so to speak. Mm. But these disorders really take off learn early in life, really around your age, Trinity. Think about some of your peers at Spelman. I had so many people when I was at the University of Maryland trying to be doctors, but they were just like you. They were failing every bio class. And yeah. I, was like, have you, I was like, have you looked over at the physical therapy school? Maybe you could do that. <laughs> or maybe you could do that. Or maybe you could do something else. Like, what's your true passion? What's your true desire? And you really find that a lot of in college students because we were all groomed to say, this is where we need to be. Right. I'm just so proud of some of these generational curses that are being undressed mm -hmm. so that we can really start to blossom. Exactly. And, you know, I think that like that's super important, too, is because I knew that my passion was within like helping people. It just I wasn't in the correct like line of work or going in the right direction of helping people. So like there's millions of ways that you can help people. So I'm glad that like I found what I wanted to do within another field. And then like the more um, that I saw myself in my psych classes and learning about like these different disorders, abnormal psychology, you know, shout out um, my professor, Dr. Watson Singleton. Um, that was my favorite class. It was the most memorable, you know, even though sometimes it got a little bit difficult, just learning everything about everything that I could, you know, in one semester about different um, disorders and then being taught that at an HBCU, we really um, get into disorders and then like how they affect the black community. So I actually really want to dive straight in. And you just brought up a great point, how it affects the black community. Exactly. Our chat box is lit up with all of these things. And this overdiagnosis, mm -hmm. it starts with this melanin in our skin. Right. We're afraid to ask questions. Ro, Re Regina, you are so correct. We're afraid to speak up. We have a fear of trusting these clinicians with telling someone what's wrong. And there's so many environmental intersects in the Black community that these overdiagnoses feel as if there's this one, one recipe, one treatment plan for all of us. And that's not the case. Why? Because we're such a diverse group of people. But Trina, you said you had a question. What you got? Yes. So for our viewers, because schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, we have this um, preconceived notion of like what these disorders look like. Schizophrenia, the first thing that you think of for somebody that, you know, does not know the DSM um, version of what schizophrenia is, that may look like to the average person, oh, that's somebody that's, that hears voices or bipolar disorder is oh, that means you're sad one minute, you're happy the next. Like you just have mood swings. So because you are a professional, this is your field and you can give us the clinical definition. 
Um, define to us what is schizophrenia and what is bipolar disorder. So schizophrenia is a mental health condition mm -hmm. and it affects everything from how we think to how we feel to how we behave. But it doesn't have to mean that it's controlling your life, specifically the lows that you may feel, those moments of hopelessness. There are there's a pop, there's um, pot um, potential symptoms everywhere from the depressive moments to these high, high balance moments and things like that in the bipolar um, individual. So what I want people to understand is I wanted to explain, I want to define these in the simplest form. Schizophrenia, as well as both bipolar, are mental health conditions, are mental health conditions. When something's a mental health condition, I feel like we fray, we fray against that, like, oh, oh, you know, she says she's got something. But I want us to start thinking of mental health in a, not in a condition form, but in a hygiene form. The same way we take care of our physical hygiene, brushing our teeth, washing our face, cleaning our skin, grooming our hair. That is the same care and need on a daily basis, our mental health hygiene needs. So when we think of bipolar in the simplest form, it's this pendulum swing, highs and lows going back. But some people go from a manic component, that's beyond my high. So my high may be celebratory, but I can bring it back. But when somebody is truly bipolar and they're in this manic episode, they are on one where 1,000, they're up to like 10,000. And then when they are on this low component, which we call the depress depressive moments, they are low, low, like negative 1 million, which can intervene suicidal thoughts, self-harm thoughts, re retreating. You have to be concerned with hype, with, with individuals who become hermits. They're self, they're self-contained. They don't want to see people. They don't engage with people. They have hallucinations. They have delusions. They have beliefs that something is after them or everyone is after them. That's my schizophrenia community. They have a disbelief and a disconnect from most realities. But if you hear what many schizophrenic patients highlight, there is truth in what they're saying. There's been an event. There's been something that's brought into this place of fear. And often that's misdiagnosed because everybody's working on the present, pre the present presentation. Oh my God, she's in here. She's hearing voices. She's delusion. She's like, what sparked that event? What got us here? And what it takes is the medical community, those that intervene with these kind of patients, having an understanding of environmental stressors Big ones in the racial in the in the in black community, racial trauma. We see that in our cinema. We see that in toxic workplaces. We see that in relationships. We see that around the kitchen table on Sunday dinner. It's in our house, and often those are where those triggers and events launch. Sexual abuse, high by in, interfamily sexual abuse, pedophilia in families, highlighted and hidden. The secrets that we don't talk about. Often we ask individuals to carry that. Carrying those loads becomes a burden. It's layers, layers, and layers, and layers. Think about putting things in a pot. In a pot. Eventually, mm -hmm. that pot reaches its capacity. And mental health shows up in all type of forms. But there in, in, the, in schizophrenia, 2.4 2 .4 African Americans are diagnosed with schizophrenia. And we're finding from a recent study in 2018 that of that 2.4% of diagnosis, only 0.25% are accurate. Yes. That is so detrimental. Mm -hmm. That means there are individuals out here being diagnosed as having schizophrenia incorrectly. And a lot of times it takes a professional or a family member or somebody looking in to say, let's look into that. If you have been diagnosed with schizophrenia, after having only one appointment with your therapist, run. This is a this takes an extensive understanding, historical data collection, interviews, and intersex. Yes, we may need to stabilize you when you first show up and right. you're saying they've got me, they're coming, they're coming. Yes, we need to stabilize you. But and I think, yeah, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go, 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 go. Okay. I think what a lot of people also um, don't understand is, and this is something I too did not understand until I actually learned about what schizophrenia really was, is that this is a complex disorder. This is not something that you can just, you you wake up one day, find the next day, you hear a voice in your head, and then boom, it's schizophrenia. First of all, schizophrenia takes over six months, almost up to a year to fully diagnose. There's different um schizo disorders um there's brief psychotic disorder which is having experiencing um 
uh, an array of psychotic symptoms for I think what is it two to five days? Or it's a really short period of time, and then there's schizophrenia form, and there's schizoaffective disorder, and then there's full out schizophrenia. So there has to be, like you said, um, this people often look at the present. There has to be some sort of past. And schizophrenia, although it does have a genetic component, it is not something that you are living with your entire life. A lot of I think. Um, with schizophrenia in men, the usual diagnosis time starts at like 18 versus women. Um, the symptoms, there's an onset of symptoms like in their later 20s to early 30s. And most of that is probably stemmed from trauma. Even though you could have a genetic component um, for it, it could be um, environmental factors that kind of bring on your onset of symptoms. And then schizophrenia also is not just hearing voices and seeing things. Schizophrenia could be could show up at first as the um, depressive symptoms. We call that the negative symptoms, um, symptoms that, or things that kind of take away from your normal life. And then we look at positive symptoms, experience that are added on, which is the delusions and the hallucinations. And, um, you know, just, you know, those Rocket types of things. Science, Trinity. Yeah. Go, Trinity. <laughs> yeah, this is my, this is my, you taught her well. You taught her well, Spelman. You taught her well. Spelman, you taught her well. <laughs> Thank and you. You're absolutely right. What do you think about that disparity? So we see this onset of, of ailments in African-American males closer to their late teens to early 20s. Mm -hmm. But women, we don't see it until the late 20s, early onset of their 30s. Do we know what's usually going on in that aspect of life for women? Well, I mean, something that would be an obvious, would, would look like an obvious connection between the two, at least for men, is that men uh, specifically black men they are coming into their adult years and becoming like a man of their own and the and what i was going to bring up later but i'm glad you know we can just jump right into it is that men that are especially black men that are living in neighborhoods where you know it's not the safest and they've been growing up with socioeconomic um challenges their their entire lives you know they might present as paranoid or they might think that like you know people are after them or that um maybe even in women they think that they can hear voices of like maybe their deceased relative talking to them and that and that's another aspect we didn't discover the spiritual context exactly so in some cultures especially in my african diaspora that's celebrated and that right. oh this is or even you know even in my southern roots the individuals that can quote unquote speak in tongues you know that connection that deep dive prophecy connection with church and that's a celebration but as you know as we're highlighting in the chat right now that's also an indication of not being well. But for my men, that 18 to 20 range is when they've been let go. We have an issue in the African-American community where we kick our children out at 18. Mm -hmm. But how well have we armed it, especially our men, how well have we armed them to be prepared and um, prosper and, and, and be able to be pros prosper and successful on in that level of independence? finding a home. You know, and then when you're out there, you no longer have that comfort and cushion of this known environment. And so now there's this freedom of what's going on, different expressions, different concerns, different light being shined. You're seeing new things. The food is different. The experience is different. How you care for yourself is different. And there's a higher onset of, whoa, 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 whoa. There's so much coming at me of difference for our males. For our women, they have this, this longer layer of like this protective coat because they usually are waiting to be brought out of the family home for marriage, childbearing years, things like that. And a lot of our, dis our misdiagnosis with women is that these behaviors start to present after pregnancy. So now mm -hmm. we're not just with the schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, we're connecting it with, oh, she's got postpartum depression. Depression, these depressive mood swings are highly seen in schizophrenia and, bi and bipolar disorders. So there's this misdiagnosis again when all we really needed to do was sit back, do a good social study, social history of the family, understand that just because grandma had it, just because mom had it, doesn't mean I have to keep it. And I think we miss those layers when we have done these things of trying to class everybody into one school of thought. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, she's schizophrenic. Oh, that means she's hearing voices. That means she's eluded. Schizophrenia, like you said, is so complex. It comes in so many different forms. So you really have to start learning to treat from origins. And for my therapists in the room, I want you to discontinue taking the medical records that you receive from 
previous clinicians, previous physicians, previous nurse practitioners, and taking it as the gospel. I want you to talk to your clients. I want you to meet your patients. I want you to understand who they are present day. Often we take those eight minute in the room visits. Okay, okay, okay. And usually there's somebody in there like she needs to be on this. This is the milligram dosage she needs to be on. Be on. When was that initially established? Mm -hmm. When was that initially established? Why are we continuing to give those labels? Let's do the work. Because a lot of time those labels keep us stalled from really prospering. Now, this is, like I said before, mental health hygiene is a, is a lifelong commitment. The same way we commit to wanting to keep these teeth in our mouth, the same way we commit to wanting to keep this skin glowing, this melanin popping, we have to make sure that our emotional, behavioral, and yes, let's loop it in there, our spiritual, be, um, our spiritual health is all coming from a place of wellness. Because mm -hmm. when we deep dive into attaching labels, we get stuck into these boxes. And like some of us in our community never get to climb out because it's stamped everywhere we go. So from jobs, and then we start to believe it. From jobs to relationships, to connections, to how we engage, to how we don't engage. And so we have to really start with rinsing off some of this residue that's been historic and how we treat the African-American community and mental health disorders and start from a place of, let me understand you today, but then also without discounting where they've been yesterday. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Trinity. So I actually want to back up a little bit because you did bring up my next question. Um, you know, as we talked about a little bit, we touched on it, that uh, there are a lot of symptoms, you know, a lot of manual uh, clinical definition, you know, straight out of the book symptoms that can be mistaken um, for Black people being in touch with their cultural aspects, their spiritual aspects. So I wanted to ask you, what are some symptoms that you see um, that practitioners can mistake in bipolar disorder, schizophrenia for, and Black individuals? So I hate to say it, but the, the leading one is a substance abuse issue Okay, that is closeted. A lot of times we don't realize that drug use has emerged. So where, you know, we think about our core, cocaine, heroin, um, marijuana, alcohol, there are so many um, synthetic um, recreational, what we call party drugs right now, where mm -hmm. people are manufacturing their own quote unquote highs. And let me tell you, creativity got heavy during yes. the pandemic as I was inside with my Tide Pods, my bath salts and things like that. You were just like, what are you on? You can't even describe it to the paramedic and things like that. So yeah. as we intersect these difficult chemical imbalances, a lot of times we get misdiagnosis with disorders, but it's coming from a place of substance abuse. And substance abuse comes from a manifestation of something's not right, it doesn't feel good, I want a euphoric feeling. feeling. Well, what am I running from? What do I? What am I seeking this euphoric feeling from? Is it something? Is it some trauma I've been through? Is it an ad, a, a adverse, um, adverse reaction I've had from something that in my past I'm trying not to see, or I'm trying not to withhold, or to you know really deal with or cope with? So mm -hmm. I think a lot of it comes with substance abuse, mis disorders, and a lot of people present. That's the only thing. Like it's not like track marks up the arm, things like that. There are a lot of functional addicts running around right and believe it or not the highest the biggest drug dealer and it, there was a study done in um was it 2017 that the biggest drug manufacturer of illicit drugs believe it or not was walmart because people are getting the ingredients from walmart their regular prescription and elevating it a notch elevating it a notch okay like yes i may be on oxycodone but now i'm gonna mix it with a little Benadryl, Tylenol, cold and flu. Yeah. Any of these, like, you know, you got to show your ID to get certain, like, over the over the counter medications. Mm -hmm. It's because we are manufacturing scissorb, things like that. Individuals mm -hmm. we know having seizures, different adverse reactions. All of this is coming from a place of something's going on and I'm running from it. And I'm right. running from it. I'm looking to heal that. The other thing, my women, the misdiagnosis of postpartum depression. I've had it all along, but now I have a fear that I've created this new life. Are they going to have these same feelings, these same experience, experiences? It's fear. It's uh, discomfort. It's acknowledging there is something going on with me that I never dealt with. Have I passed it on to this new life I've created? A lot of time in my general, in my with my gentlemen, we're seen as they're so angry in our community. These diagnoses of conduct disorder, behavior, mood disorders, and things like that. All of it's coming from a places no one's ever stopped 
to just try to understand my journey. Mm -hmm. Paranoia, racial profiling, we have all seen it's real. George Floyd, we are not imagining that. Emmett Till, we did not imagine that. We have not imagined these things that have happened to our communities. So when you see those lights flashing in the back of your car, in the back seat of, in the back of your rear view mirror, the first thing I go to is today the day. I'm the mother of two black boys. I'm married to a magnificent black man. My paranoia of what would have been diagnosed as paranoia two decades ago is now justified understanding of how their life may go. My little ones are three and five. They're cute and cuddly, but there'll be a point where they grow larger. They grow bigger and someone will see them as fearful, aggressive. So that's not paranoia. Okay. Mm. That, that's racial understanding of our current journey. And a lot of time that gets interpreted as illness. We have women who say, oh, you know, I had, um, I cut my breast off. I was, I have a history of um, breast cancer in my family and people have died from. So I went forward and had a mastectomy and people go, oh no, that's brave of her. Or some people go to extreme, like, why would you do that if you never when diagnosed with breast cancer? There's things that they've seen, the power, the, the pain, the struggle of watching a loved one decay from that. And they're mm -hmm. working on from a place of avoidance to not have that same experience. But often it's having these conversations um, before you diagnose someone, because so much is mistaken because we just don't take the time to adapt and adjust to understanding. Right. And I want to back up to um, the point where you're talking about substance abuse, you know, being one of the main uh, symptoms that, you know, uh, we do experience within our Black community um, and being mistaken for symptoms of like bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. Um, psychosis. Psychosis is a symptom of, it can be a symptom of schizophrenia. You do, you do not have to be psychotic in order to have a schizophrenia diagnosis, but a lot of substance that um, people do take, like you said, people have been getting created. There's new drugs out that are inducing a state of psychosis. I feel like um, long-term um, substance abuse can you know, lead to psychosis and one that presents with psychotic symptoms to a hospital. I, People might be go ahead and go ahead and uh, push that diagnosis of being schizophrenic. I'm sorry, of having schizophrenia because schizophrenic is an outdated term. Um, one might go ahead and push that diagnosis of schizophrenia onto the patient that had that is only experienced a psychotic episode without doing the proper research of well, how long has this person been experiencing psychotic symptoms? Are they also experiencing negative symptoms like depression and um? anhedonia and not being able to function like how they used to are they you know just overall sad or angry or anything like that and then i also think that by um i'm sorry postpartum uh depression is also super important because these are real and i think that a lot of people are mistaking real and validated experiences especially of black women um to take advantage of their vulnerability especially in the healthcare field we know that um Black maternal health care is not where it should be. Uh, black women are not receiving adequate uh, Black maternal health care like they should be. And I think that um, a lot of times Black, we are searching for answers, you know, and it could just be by, a, I'm sorry, postpartum depression when you're dealing with a kid. And then, like you said, knowing that you, you will be raising Black men one day. And that could automatically be um, misinterpreted for being paranoid when in, this is our reality. So mm -hmm. I think that that definitely touches on um, cultural competency, but we will talk about that in a minute. I want to move forward to um, our next question, which is what kind of trends do you see in Black individuals like with these diagnoses? Like, do you see socioeconomic trends, uh, spiritual patterns? Like, what, what do you see? The social economic patterns are the are the biggest piece because it's such a stall when you attach these labels to anyone mm -hmm. for them to be able to magnify um, performance, um, being able to attach to jobs, careers, independence, and it becomes such a social and an economic factor because now you have impoverished this person from a place from a, from a, from me mentally speaking. Mm -hmm. So now that I have this label. When I go to apply for jobs, you know, because a lot of times we jail the mentally ill. Mm -hmm. so I have this record. And oftentimes this what could have been a misdemeanor is escalated as a felony. Why? Because as individuals are trying to take me, I'm fighting, you know, I'm fighting back. In fact, now I've seen this assault charge, things like that. So mm -hmm. it's a stall 
with the pro with with progression and often we're parents so now my inability to provide and to take care of my children has now pushed down to the next generation maybe perhaps we have social services engagement and involvement the school has put us in a stigmatic um um location medicine is a driver to so much harm that is going on in the black community. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm applaud I'm applauding everyone to get engaged and get involved. We need more black gynecologists. We need more black psychologists. We need more black social workers. We need more black male educators. We need our black males in early el elementary schools. Cause a lot of times it starts at school for our young people. This person's acting, this person's acting out. They've been referred out and they and referred to individuals engaged in medicine that come back with either a prescription for a five-year-old, which at this point we have not even let their minds blossom and develop. They have right. any major milestones in development, but we're already engaged in chemistry to transition who they are. Right. You see these patterns over and over again, and they happen in these communities with socioeconomic dependence on our oppressive systems that exist. And for everyone who believes medicine is not an oppressive system, I want you to research how many women in 2021 and 2022 died just by trying to give birth that are classified as African-Americans. I want you to research how many individuals have malnutrition disorders and are classified as Black Americans or Black and Black of Black Africans, Black Caribbeans that have malnutrition components. I want you to edu educate yourself on what's going on with the vitamin D deficiency over diagnosis. I want you to educate how these systems, from the education system to medicine systems, to all of these systems are, con are contributing to the oppressive disorders that are taking place in these trends with misdiagnosis. A lot of them are coming through these patterns of complicity. We are, we are all complicit because we are enduring and we're okay with this. We have some people who make noise, but the noise stops. Our voices go deaf. And we have to recognize that change only happens with tangible actions. Um, for me, I, I appreciate what's going on here with you, Trinity. Understanding that your um, passion was in mental health. Now I need you to be actively engaged. Mm -hmm. and I need you not to just be actively engaged, but if we're going to downplay these the, and decrease these trends and patterns, I need you to bring a friend. I need you to build tables. I need us to become builders where we are all waiting for seats at tables already established, where we have to start setting up our own table, building our own seat, and welcoming those voices that we know can contribute to positive, tangible change. In 2020, I started a platform known as Clinician Fest. I want you guys all to go look up Clinician Fest. <laughs> and I want you guys, and Black Mental, Black, uh, Mental Health Matters was a big part of our on these last two conferences that we've had, where we're really hosting these conversations and promoting, and promoting innovative, transit, transformative thought in mental health approaches. We are welcoming licensed marriage and family therapists. We're working, we're manage, work um, nurses, doctors from all, from chiropractors to dentists. Yes, dentistry is a big piece. Those dentists that set up in our communities and get that Medicaid money and start just removing teeth unnecessarily, mm -hmm. complicit, oppressive system. So we want everybody at the table being a part of these necessary and needed conversations. Right now, we're hosting a fall series that are just bringing in these conversations on with everything. Trinity, I want to offer you a seat. Come on down. Mm -hmm. We also have Clinician Fest 2023 happening May 4th through 5th where we have a call for proposals out right now. And I want these folks, especially these, vi these vivacious voices in the chat box that have something to say on mental health, I want you to permit us, submit a proposal. i giving you a platform where these voices can be, ex these voices can be expanding. Your invitations, your research, here it is. Don't ever say nobody welcomed you to a table. This is Trinity Thompson and Dr. Camille Jones giving right you that here. Right, now, right here. So, but I wanna ask you, um, Trinity, from a, and this is, I hate to, to do this because now I'm feeling like an old head, but from a <laughs> generational perspective, mm -hmm. are we in trouble from a mental health standpoint? Yes, <laughs> I think we are. And you can ask any of my friends, anybody that knows me, I'm always going around saying that we are in trouble and we need help because mm -hmm. 
I think that the generational traumas and the generational patterns of not believing in the power of seeking therapy is really doing damage. And we're not going to do anything but continue to pass on generational traumas. We are so far from where we came from 200, 300 years ago, even 100 years ago, even if, even 50 years ago. But we are still very clearly holding on to generational traumas that come out in subconscious ways. And we are passing on to our children. We are harming the relationships that we have already fostered with the people like with our parents our friends our partners um our distant family members i think that not just in the sense of a diagnosis a clinical diagnosis but just in the sense that our mental health is very fragile right now and if we are not educated especially by our own people people that look like me and you then we are going to continue to listen to people that don't that are not culturally aware of the situations that we have been through um, as members across the African diaspora. And we are going to just yeah. continue to, you know, keep going. And I, I want to applaud you on having that level of awareness mm -hmm. um, across the Aspr African diaspora. There is going to be, and this is not based on any research Dr. Jones has done, but it's just based on my visualization. We have a whole population from 2020 when the world went inside to today, that everything that they experience in that time frame is going to erupt. And I say that from a place of um, just looking at some of our historical trends and patterns. We have socially isolated the fragile. Mm -hmm. and so how do you think they're coming outside now? Even more broken, even more um, despondent, even more in need of support. We have some voices. We've got some voices. We've got Naomi Yosaki. We've got some voices coming forward, discussing mental health, prioritizing mental health. So it's becoming Hollywood for people to say, I've got a therapist. And I'm hoping that's not going to be dismissive of true mental health aid mm -hmm. making its way to the forefront. I want our community to discontinue um, stig the stigma that keeps specifically our men and our young women from getting help. I want us to move from a place of, oh, she, you know, she crazy. She cray cray. I want us to stop with those, like those cultural jokes. Mm -hmm. Because those, that sticks and stones might hurt my, break my bones, but words would never hurt me. B biggest lie we were ever told. Words and language have so much power. The same way these labels do. And so it's so important that we are active participants in changing away these patterns and trends. These diagnoses of the socially isolated are about to erupt in misdiagnosis for bipolar, schizophrenia, manic depressants, those kind of things. But we have to be on the front line, giving us giving comfort, and we need to create community and space for individuals with these diagnoses. This shame of saying I have a therapist, this shame of saying I'm not okay, this um, time span we have put on people when they go through grief, we say, oh, you know, well, that, yeah, your mother died, but that was like two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I supposed to be okay? Right. <laughs> Costco chicken, mac and cheese, and green beans at the re at the repast. <laughs> Am I supposed to be well today? Exactly. We we need to give these this passage to individuals to have comfort in their journey to wellness. And we need to recognize that that will come in all kinds of forms. What I consider well for Camille may not be what Trinity considers well for Trinity. There are going to be different, and we need to have a platform and community of acceptance of that. And I think we move from one is that, oh, you know, you need Jesus. You got come to church with me next Sunday. And that may be a great spoonful of wellness. But what you can have Christ and a counselor, okay? Mm, I like have, that. Yep, you can have scriptures and a prescription, okay? You can have all of that, okay? We need to not just thank Jesus, God, us all. Coming from a Christian, my grandfather was a big time Baptist minister. So mommy, grandma, granddad, I am not speaking down on the religion. But I'm saying we cannot, we have to also stand in that pul pul pulpit and promote it's okay. Yeah, a lot of times our black community, that's where we get our guidance, the church. And if we can partner with the church on some of these aspects and, you know, just correct some wrongness that has been put out there, we can do it. If we can partner with some of these oppressive systems with medicine, 
And I want you guys to be okay with moving your feet. If you have a physical health relationship with a physician that does not see you, I want you to move your feet. I want you to get out there and do your same due diligence. The same way we get online and look at the reviews before we go to that Sunday brunch. I want you guys doing the reviews on these clinicians and these physicians. And I want you guys as patients doing it. If you got somebody good, tell the world about them. See Dr. Jones, contact Miss Doc Jones, follow her. She's dropping little mental health nuggets every day on Twitter. Follow Miss Doc Jones, at Miss Doc Jones, at Mrs. Doc Jones, at MRSD, <laughs> DLC, J-O-N-E-S. Trinity, I'm a mess right now. <laughs> but I want you guys to know this wellness out there. Trinity, how do we follow you? You better have a social me media presence. I No, I do. Okay. You know what? I'm going okay. to I'm going to um, tag um, both of us at the end in a um, banner so that way you guys can um, okay. find us both on social media. I'm actually trying to... Um, use my YouTube channel more as a platform to talk about mental health because not to um, shy away from what we were talking about here today, but I um, do have a video up because September is Suicide Awareness and Prevention Month. I do have awareness, video. No. Yes, I do have a video um, uh, sharing my personal experience. And I also just wanted to say, um, I think transparency and vulnerability is like a major thing that a lot of, uh, especially Black people tend to shy away from when it comes to mental health but i like to be transparent and one of the one of my um more honest moments in mo my transparent moments about me is that i may look like i'm fine you know i walk around here i have you know i graduated college i have a good job right now but i um do deal with a major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder it's something that i've been dealing with for a few years now and i at first i was Embarrassed. I'm gonna be honest. I was embarrassed to say that I um was seeking therapy, but now I'm proud to say it because there has been nothing but just overall growth in the person that I am in, you know, my overall character development that I would not have been able to get from. Not also not um just like my family and uh, seeking comfort in my religion and um you know the way that I my relationship with God, but also being in therapy, these are trained professionals. And I think that we would feel more comfortable seeking therapeutic services if we have more people that look like us, which is why I'm aspiring to go into this field, which is why I'm sure you are in this field right now is that we need us. And I'm not, I'm not shooting down my therapist because I love her, you know, <laughs> Miss DeLeon, if you're watching this, like I love you. That's right. Oh, let, oh. Let, let people know there's a good one out there. But what, I, what yes. What bravery, what bravery, what bravery, what bravery. I saw everybody. If you may not even think that there's anything wrong with you, and there might not be, but therapy is a great um option, a great route to go down if you just want to become a better person. Like if you, we all have flaws. You can, we it's okay. Flaws. You can go see it. You don't have to walk out with a diagnosis. You can just go see somebody and talk. There's nothing wrong with that. You have to realize that life experiences happen. And we all are expected to have this cloak of, okay, just deal with it. Oh, it's happening. It's over. But you can just be in a store, minding your business, doing your thing, and somebody's following you. And that's traumatic because mm -hmm. you understand they're following you for all the reasons, all the wrong reasons, those kind of things. But Trin, let me go back to this. First of all, salute. Thank salute, you. queen. Salute, Thank queen. You. And, you, and I want you to understand that you are more of the, um, more common than you know. There are so many of us out here in what I call costume, Camille included. And I had done a, uh, I had did a talk on um, story colliders and I just spoke about grief and how in the black community, there's this hurry up piece of grief. But I lost my best friend, my dad. We had a house fire at our home in New York. My dad gave his life to save me and my mother. And I was supposed to be okay. And I remember coming out of people saying, what do you need? I'm like, just pray for my mom because I was mad as hell with God. But that is like, what? You're mad at God. Oh my God, get the sage born and hit it with the holy oil, those kind of mm -hmm. things. And I went through this grief process and I realized I did not grieve initially because I was trying to be in costume for the comfort of others. And that is dangerous. That is dangerous. Have your journey, have your moment. Trinity, to say that that's where you were and then to elevate to say, this is how I've prospered because I have been intentional about addressing my mental health hygiene is all we want to deliver today. That's all we want to do. So if anybody says, how was the podcast? I want you to say, you nailed it. 
<laughs> we didn't even need Miss Doc Jones on there. I, I, I was the shout. <laughs> I was the shout. Because look at her. Look at them lashes. Got me envious over here. Look at that <laughs> hair. Look at that hair. Look at those edges. Oh my God, we pray for edges like that. Okay? <laughs> but here she is saying also, in, in addition to, I have this. This has been my journey. And so many people elect not to go Trinity's way, which is why we have an entire month of suicide awareness. We've lost so many lives for people who felt like did not have a space to speak up. They did not have a understanding of raising their hand to say, I need some help. We need to move past those mindsets. It's killing off our young, specifically. We have not magnified what's truly important in life, materialism, and being able to conform with what's in today is what has so many Black individuals with these diagnoses or these undiagnosed, these untreated symptoms out here feeling like the only way left is to take my life and leave. We need to move past those patterns. Therapy is okay. I want, if you got a, a therapist that's rocking out, I want you to get on your social media and say, she's got openings. He's got appointments. Here we go. Black girls, um, therapy for black girls, um, black mental health, men's health talk. There's so many podcasts out right now that I want you to look into. And I want us to um, really be checking on these babies. One of the comments in here from the Wallace Way, shout out to the Wallace family, is these IEPs. Anybody know what an IEP, those individual educational plans we put on children that sticks them in special education, that makes them feel like they cannot, they can't or they don't have the ability, aptitude, or capabilities to, we got to move past those. Those are dangerous weapons as well that are damaging generations. We have options here, ladies and gentlemen. We have to be tangible with our actions and move to making them happen. Bravo against Trinity. What next question do you have? Thank you. All right. So, you know, it's so easy to go ahead and talk about just everything as it pertains to mental health, but we are here today to talk about schizophrenia and bipolar disorder in the Black community. And I feel like a really big part of that is cultural competency. And for those that don't know what cultural competency is, it is the awareness, the understanding, the empathy of having knowledge about different cultures as um, for anybody, well, for anybody in general, but as it pertains to this, practitioners, it is very important for um, us practitioners, will hopefully be soon, but um, us practitioners in the mental health field to be cultural competent as we serve a variety of um, communities. So within the Black community, you may think that it's just one community as a whole, yes, but there are different communities that exist within the um, Black community. African American, the African American community, the Jamaican community, the Haitian community, the um, the uh, different di diasporic groups in um, the islands and across seas. Just there are different um religions can be um a different aspect of cultural competency uh race gender uh sexuality all those things so it's really important for us to understand um our clientele and understand where we're coming from or at least uh, to understand and to have a basic level of empathy for those groups because we are not serving the same person um i am not the same person as dr Jones. Dr. Jones is not the same person as the next black person because we have the same skin color does not mean that we have the same experiences. So I need you also to understand mm -hmm. cultural competency is not an automatic because our skin tones match. Right. Exactly. Black experience. We have a lot of black people who believe because I'm black, I got it. But my black experience as a New Yorker, I you said you were from Connecticut earlier, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Black New Yorkers, like black city, New York kids. We believe everybody in Connecticut is rich. I don't know. We we grew up like that. Then I met my husband who's from Connecticut. He was like, eh, no, no, no castle, no gold nuggets down here, no gold bars and things like that. Those are my Haitian community, my Haitian community, different from my Jamaican community, my, my, my East African versus my West African versus my South African. So many differences. My European, my black friends that were born in Switzerland, Germany different things. Then there's those that were born in Switzerland, Germany, but they were born on an American base. Those life experiences. Cultural competency means asking. Get out and ask. I had to take a, I, and I didn't even realize how much cultural bias we have as well mm -hmm. as black people, because we try to include all of it in our dialect, in our experiences and things like that. Ask. 
ask. My my experience as a black person is not that that's going to match everything that every other black person has. Where are you from? Where I'm from is different. Me, black New York Camille is different from Connecticut, Kentucky, Idaho, California, Guam, Samoan Islands, Haiti, all kind of difference. My yeah. skin color, let's not miss, dismiss that. My skin color is a total different acceptance in Dominican Republic than it is in Ghana. And I've had the, both of those experiences. When a colorism is a big piece of understanding cultural competency. And like you, like, like you said, there's different experience, there's levels to it. And understanding that helps you better meet your client where they are. But where we fail with cultural competency is making the assumption. You're right. Making the assumption. Ask. When, when, when the onset of pronouns, I have been jacking that up forever. I will go straight off my visualiz visualization mm -hmm. when I need to ask, what are, what are your pro preferred pronouns? And so it goes, they, them, not she, or he. And I, and I say, I, I say, I want to apologize. I'm going to stumble upon this, but I want you to just give me some grace because I'm trying. The same thing with ask, you know, gender components, just because this is what I present doesn't mean this is what I assimilate towards. Ask me. And you believe it or not, people think they're so rude. You should know. You should know. How? That ignorance of feeling like you can't ask is another stall in understanding true cultural competency. And to all you therapists who believe your skin tone is a past within our community, no. Okay? We are checking cards at the barbecue front door. We are no <laughs> longer inviting everybody to the cookout. Okay? All skin folk ain't kin folk. Okay? So oh we are gosh. checking you know, we're checking your ID at the cookout door. And then we want you, because we want you to be, be intentional about learning and growth. The day you stall yourself on wanting to understand and expand is the day you should hang it up, okay? Learning and this understanding of what's going on is continuous evolution. What we dealt with two years ago, what we dealt with five years ago, is going to be so different from what we have going on in the next decade. So right. much different, all right? What else you got? I know we're coming up on time. Come on, Trini. Yes. All right. All right. So I'm glad you mentioned that because like you said, all skin folk and kin folk. And my mom always says, um, you don't know until you know. And I think that's really important. That's something that sticks with me because like you said, cultural competency is not a natural trait that we have. Cultural competency is learned. You will not have it unless you learn it because me as an African-American, I won't even have um, the right understanding of a, a first generation a first generational African American, like somebody whose parents just came here and had them here. Like I wouldn't have that experience unless I asked them and I know. And I know people like that. So it, you know, there's all different types of things. There's all types of intersections that actually separate um us members of the African diaspora. But so I'm glad that you mentioned that. So my question to you is do you think that black mental health practitioners actually play a role in the overdiagnose overdiagnosis of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder? I hate to say it, 100%. We do. And I think it comes from sometimes, and this is why people, I'm going to, I know after this segment, I'm going to get um, messages. Are you seeing, taking new patients? Are you taking new patients? And my answer is no, I am at capacity. And I'm at capacity because I want to continue to serve well. Okay. Mm -hmm. We, there's a shortage of us, but there, we are out here. And I talk, find people all the time, there are openings, they are out. Do not let people think there's no Black therapist, there's no Caribbean therapist, there's no African therapist, there's no opportunity for you to get help. There are Black mental health practitioners out here, but we play a role in these overdiagnosis when we don't do our job well. We too are overdiagnosing, overprescribing, and underlistening. We are not doing our due diligence. We are not we are not doing our research with a paper for the patient. We are not taking that time on our schedule to get down and talk to them. We are seeing our patients for eight to fifteen minutes. Eight to fifteen minutes. I cannot tell you what the journey has been. I need you to understand and unpeel me. I need you to unwrap me. We need to have multiple sessions together for you to gain an understanding before you come in with a clipboard highlighted diagnosis. Exactly. But sometimes we're lazy. And because it's come in with that, that diagnosis travel with them, that label travel with them, we're rocking with it. We're like, oh, half the work's done. Okay, let me just get it through this part, this part, this part, this part, this part. But I want you to understand we are complicit in hurting our own people. Mm -hmm. Guys, I hate to do this, but yesterday I went on a date. 
No. <laughs> you have a mother of three, you do not get to date. Okay. And my husband took us to see the woman king. I want you guys to get out there and get that because we had, um, and it, it, it just spoke about things that we knew already, how our people were complicit in hurting our own people. I don't want to give all the movie away. I will, I will just tell you, Viola rocked it. Um, and we need to understand if we're having that same, if we're doing that same abuse, instilling that same trauma, that same injustice in the mental health field as Black professionals. Mm -hmm. As practitioners, there's an oath we take, right? But then there's this cultural understanding and oath that we know we have a responsibility towards. And we need to make sure we are rocking that part above it. Right. When you sit on these IEP panels as a Black clinician, Black practitioner, and you see your counterparts doing, doing, doing this, when you sit at that table, speak up. When you're in those treatment team meetings, even if it's not your patients, you got a doctor saying this, 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 being dismissive, speak up. We are complicit in a lot, especially when we are silent. And a lot of times people say, well, I didn't do that. Yes, but you also didn't do anything else. Right. Okay. Yeah, I, def no, I definitely agree because um, I think that sometimes, and I've actually like seen this myself, is that uh, people of our community do get into a position of power. And then, like you said, they forget to do their due diligence and then they take advantage of the fact that there are people that are hurting, but not taking the um, an adequate amount of time to really like pick apart the problem and see like what would actually be beneficial as opposed to, it's easier to just, this is how you present to me. I'm gonna write you a prescription for this, this, that, and that. And I feel like that also kind of like ties into the whole um, the uh, the financial you know gain of being able to write all these ideas because yeah, as you know, uh, the healthcare system is it's a money maker for the United States. And now I'm not saying this to make people uh, think twice about taking their medication because there are people that do need to be on medication. So. I, I want to make that very clear. I'm not against I'm not against medication, but what I am trying to say is that a lot of times when uh, people present as one thing and the the actual diagnosis is not the diagnosis that the doctor gave, it's an easy way out and a money maker. So I think that's so reimbursements in the, this mm -hmm. this social economically oppressed system are a great driver. Like I think for me, if I bill a client, like if I do one of my self-paid clients, if I bill a client, insurance company may reimburse me 50, 26, 26 to $80 perhaps for yeah. that client, where a self-paid client would be paying anywhere from 250 to 350 to see me. And so now I'm at, now access is an issue. So this whole diversity inclusion, access mm -hmm. and justice movement that's going on, y'all better loop the medical, medical system in that as well. These reimbursements are a big problem. And it really stalls, like, especially if you're coming out of medical school, these student mm -hmm. loan components, you can't take $26 when $350 is, on the, is waiting on the other side. And so there's this balance and things you have to come to. But I mm -hmm. also want you to realize, um, practitioners, and I know this is going to be an unpopular thing to say, your patients will lie to you. They That's will, true. They will lie to you. And they will lie to you because you are allowing them to. You're not giving them an avenue for you to say, well, wait a minute, didn't you tell me? Did you, you know, and I think back to my substance abuse days when you're doing those initial assessments, mm -hmm. those assessments. So those of you out in the field working on tools and instruments, get some culturally sound tools and instruments. That's another thing that we need for these assessments. Um, I only drink on the weekends. I only drink on the weekends. Okay, well, here you are with a DUI on two, four DUIs on Wednesday and Tuesday. What is the weekend as you just find it? What is the weekend as you do worry? Things like that. And so your patients they will be just as a hurry up as you will to get in and out. And you have to say, we're about to slow down and we're about to, we're about to do this right. We're about to do this well. And what that mm -hmm. means, you're going to meet me. I'm going to meet you. So when we think about this role we play as practitioners, we have to evolve. There is an oppressive system, but we can generate a new, 
new trends in that system. We talked about how we're educated through doctrines and year longs. And you've mentioned that DS5 book. I don't highlight that at all. And things like that. If you don't want to restaurant, if you don't want to include racial trauma in the DSF5, I can't, I, we can't be friends and things like that. But mm. I want you to understand that there's going to also become a point where we're going to have to create our own curriculums, our own doctrines, our own certification programs, our own certificates, our own rallies to wellness in the Black community. And this is also already happening and jumping up in our Latino community. Shout mm -hmm. out to Hispanic Heritage Month going on right now. Yep. Our, Asian, yep, our Asian community has embraced themselves. Mm -hmm. you know, highlighting now some Asian hate that was going on that inspired those conversations. But these are communities already working. The Black community, there is no mystery to what we need. Let's get out and become builders. Let's go. Yes. And you know what? I want to um, point out in the comments, um, Jean-Luc Cadet, I'm so sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, but somebody said, uh, he said the reason is because Black psychiatrists, psychologists, Social workers, et cetera, are trained in white institutions by white professors. Now, when I say this, I'm not knocking PWIs, not at all. Schools are schools are schools are school. However, I personally am grateful that I was educated by Spelman College because Black people, everything Black people was integrated in every single one of my curriculums. Even in um, when I was taking chemistry my freshman year of college, um, my professor related it back to us because she talked about, think of the chemicals that are in our hair products, things that help make our hair straight versus what make our hair curly and what's good for our hair and things like that. Um, I do, I really appreciate the fact that um, in the psychology classes, uh, learning about the black community was very um, integrated within our curriculum. And um, I'm so glad that you mentioned the uh, DSM-5 because my next question was actually going to be, how should future editions of the DSM be amended to include cultural competency? So I think we, we found um, in this last two months, the um, ASVAB, this is the accreditation system that um, licensed social workers. They were, they after maybe like three decades of pressure, they have come mm -hmm. forward and admitted that this exam is racially biased. Um, on average, about 74% of African-Americans that take the exam fail it the first time. Mm -hmm. And there's just a huge disparity in that. Um, what Dr. Um, Jean has brought up is major. But I want to say, and I'm proud to say, I, I'm I'm a product of PWIs, so I appreciate you being um, HBCU. I don't know my both my parents went to North um, Carolina Central Eagles Fly High. Shout out to mom and dad, mm -hmm. and my sisters are Aggies, um, North Carolina A&T graduates. I just mm -hmm. was in the middle right here, being uh, acting out. But <laughs> there is a 27 mm -hmm. 27 percent jump in HBCU's admissions in the last five years. And it's because cultural awareness is strengthening. And you say what you want to say by young coach Dion Sanders, but he has put Jackson State on the map, brought awareness to not just that football team, but to the academic institution that it is as well. Fam you, Bethune-Cookman College could produce teachers you would not believe, okay? Mm -hmm. Spelman, Morehouse, our medical schools, Howard University, those Hampton Pirates, Morgan State University, North Carolina Central, Fayetteville State, Elizabeth City, Virginia State, Virginia Union, shout out to the bold and green Norfolk State. These are institutions that are creating and producing sound clinician and practitioners. These are institutions that are giving academic excellence in our community. And it's awakening to see so many are migrating there. We have all been brainwashed into this genre that you have to come from an Ivy League college to make, uh, to be a success, to be recognized. And that still exists. Harvard and Yale, Princeton, Brown, Columbia, those schools have not been tarnished with what is out there people are seeking. But we need more medical schools and hospitals at HBCUs. And I believe mm. there's something going on in um, New Orleans that may at a New Orleans school that may be opening up a medical school soon, but they just can't open. We have to attend. And for right. those of us who are already licensed clinicians, got these multiple alphabets behind our names, we need to go to these institutions and become educators. I love that you could host a conversation at Spelman on the impact of perms and hair dye 
on mm -hmm. like dripping into our skins and things like that. White institutions, not because of anything derogatory, but they fear those conversations because there's a lack of comfort and understanding from a culturally com competency avenue to really host those conversations. So that's right. not in information in those textbooks. And I'm gonna be, I'm gonna mess this up, but there's an African male that is creating a medical, um, and he may, I think he did it already, created a medical textbook that has Black people in there. Black, Xavier University. Yes, Xavier. Yeah, I, I was thinking it was Xavier. Xavier. It's Xavier. Okay. I'm trying, guys. I'm trying. These, these on the spot questions. So <laughs> I'm working with you. But um, but they have those, uh, they have he's creating a medical journal and textbook that have black party parts. When you are dissecting the body, you can see the African American body and things like that. Um, but they fear these conversations. And it's not because um I don't, want, I don't want to think say this because of anything intentional, but it's just, there's just a fear of, am I going to get canceled? Cancel culture is coming. If I speak on something Black related as a Caucasian, Anglo-Saxon, or things like that. Um, allyship has been so theater, theater ridden right now. You can't even, you know, there's just such a fear of moving into these spaces. So mm -hmm. we have to do it. We have to do this for them. And then I have to say, there was a young lady who was going to high school at a predominantly white high school. And she said, what she, she, as a black American, what she hated most is that every time they were looking for a black perspective, the whole class would look inwards at her. She's like, I am 15 year old you. Like I, I my skin and my, my melanin is just, is just present, but I don't have the answers for the black culture, for the entire race. Right. <laughs> I don't I can't speak for the whole race. I'm 15 years old trying to get through this AP history class the same way you guys are. And she said that was the biggest discount she felt. Like she was not seen. She was just looked to be as a spokesman, spokesman. And she said, and then she felt like she had to take on the responsibility of being a good spokesman, making sure her answers were not, you know, for the people, Angela Davis, but her answers were more white comfort. And I said, this is how it starts. Our children start to understand and they need to show up in costume and that just magnifies. So now in my costume, I'm not applying to an HBCU, I'm applying to you know, a university, a PWI university that would be widely accepted by this community that I've been enriched with. But we have to move past these. And as far as this DSM book, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do think that like a change has to start somewhere. So, I mean, I'm not sure about the statistics of um, black practitioners or psychiatrists or researchers that are um, actually editors or writers for um, the DSM um, books. But I think that I, know, I believe that this version that just came out, that was one of the criticisms. There were none. Right. So I think that like what we social workers included in that. Yeah, like let's start there. Let's start there. Let's start yeah, let getting me, let me stick with my original. No comment. Okay, let me stick with my but um I'm gonna let some of the um viewers leave some comments um in the comment section if you guys have any questions while I ask my last question. Um or if you guys have anything you want to say. Uh so my last question to you would be, how can increased cultural awareness and competency, competency affect the race of these diagnoses? Like, do you think that it'll still increase, stay the same, drop? I hate to say it, but I think I go back to what your mom said. Like, when you know better, you do better. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? You, and it's, it's really education. It's really advancing our understanding of present day the present day diaspora of this cultural experience, understanding they're going to be hundreds of different experiences and different cultural impacts that are going to be in a context of what the Black experience is. So again, again, from a Haitian perspective, from a Haitian female perspective, from a Haitian female perspective, not born in Port-au-Prince. So it's just, <laughs> it's just, there's so many layers to that. Um, so it's, it's important that we create our own landing spot for this education to occur. So Dr. Jean is correct. The people writing the DSM are white professors um, who, you know, who believe they have cultural competency, have done the work, done studies, but there's not a representative of us. And I hate to, to say that because now that takes this, this effect of let's get one black, let's go get an Anglo, let's go get a, a Native American, let's do, you know, let's, let's pad this table and then we put that on there. But what we need to be comfortable with is what is the black 
Encyclopedia of Black Mental Health? Has anybody right. spearheaded that effort? How do we take a collective of all of these papers that we've written on culture competency, on racial trauma, on the Black experience, on the journey to wellness from depression, from anxiety, from schizophrenia, from being piloted, from um, being bipolar diagnosed? How do we take on that responsibility to do better for Black patients? Yeah. And or maybe we need our own DSM. Maybe, maybe I just have to be the DSM. You know, we got a black directory for hotels, we got a black directory for restaurants, we can have we got a black directory for um, shout out to clinicians of color, we got a black directory for that. It doesn't have to be the DSM, we don't have to take quote unquote, I don't want to say there, but that right. movement, we can create our own of what, what works best for us. Um, mm -hmm. our, first, and it, it, and it also comes from a mindset component. A lot of times we feel like this conformity with um, Western medicine is the quote unquote right way. And I say, who said that? And if it's so, is that still so? Is that still so? And when we think about the things we need, like just from a parenting standpoint, when you look at how you, how you are managing your house, the groceries you buy, you're buying organic, do you let your kids eat gluten items, do you do sugar free, are you doing diet number nine? You have this um, governance over wellness in your home, just from the manifest, just from how, what you manifest in your refrigerator. Why mm -hmm. not do the same thing with your from, that you're doing for your physical hygiene, for your mental health hygiene? Um, and but you know, and I also don't want us to be. And I, I want you to leave with this: the greatest thing we can do to increase cultural awareness and competency is we have to have tangible actions, not just speaking about it, ending it on this podcast, and we're going like that was a great idea. Let me go get me something from the Target today. It's really about standing up and promoting what's next. Um, right. and, and I want to also not be dismissive and say, it's probably out there. There's probably somebody who's done this three or four times. There's probably about 26 different things going on. But giving them a platform where it can come and be presented, where it can come and be ingested and diagnosed and added to and put on the black papers, things like that, just different things that we can add into. Sharing on platforms such as this, Black Mental Health Matters becoming a staple to where I can come for information, where I can come for awareness, where I can come to say, quote unquote, this is what's happening. Anybody have any information or ideas? Connecting mm -hmm. with people like Dr. Jean in the um in the um, chat box, connecting with those individuals who are watching from afar, but don't want to put their names in the chat box, but they'll slide in our DMs later with things. Don't slide in my DMs saying you're going to do something because I'm a follow up. Like, what's your tangible action plan? Put some right. gates on it. Let's execute and let's get it. If we're going to do better, it's going to take participation, but intentional participation for change and awareness to truly elevate. Got it. All right. So um, I don't know if anybody else has any other questions, um, but I really enjoyed this conversation. Let me go ahead and get your socials um, so I can go, um, let everybody viewing be able to follow you. So you said you are- I'm not giving you, you my social security number, but let me- <laughs> All right, let me throw it in the chat. So there's a couple of things I want you guys to follow. Um, so I want you to follow at Clinician Fest. So that's Clinician and then Fest, F-E-S-T. Right now we have an ongoing um, open call for um, practitioners to come to our Wellness Wednesday series. You're gonna, they're going to be via IG Live, even though I'm liking this stream yard. Uh, we're not as advanced as Black Mental Health Matters. Um, I want you to go to our website, www.clinicianfest.com. Fill out one of those Google forms on what are your ideas? What do you have? Do you have the black version of the DSM? Do you want to present it at Clinician Fest 2023? It's a virtual conference, extremely accord. There we go. There we go. Look at you spelling it correctly. There you go. And that's on um, LinkedIn. That's on Twitter. That's on IG. Um, posting a number of different things. I want you guys, a lot of it, you know, at Clinician Fest. There we go. And then at Miss Doc Jones. That's Mrs. at MRS DO. C J O N E S, and I want you guys to come and be intentional about engaging with me. I do not have all the answers. I am not the supreme deem queen of understanding bipolar and schizophrenia. But on mental, no, no period, oh. no period. What's oh, that? No period. Oh, oh it's all okay. So it's all just one word. Oh, just one word. Just one word. Okay. So, uh, okay. Mrs. Black Jones, yes, and I am going to be more intentional on Twitter. Is I drop, I drop mental health jewels. I try, just little tips of just trying to get you through the day. Cause there's so many people who don't come to treatment. 
So if I can give you some little nuggets, I'm not diagnosing you on Twitter. Okay. So for those of you looking for that, that will not happen. Okay. I'm enjoying my licensure. Okay. I'm not <laughs> diagnosing you on Twitter, but I will guide and steer you. If you live someplace to me, I don't know a therapist out here. I'll go into my Rolodex. Yes, I still have a paper Rolodex. Okay. If the internet goes down, I'm going to survive. Um, and just really try to see if I can get you connected to somewhere. Um, if you could put it in the chat as well, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I can type in the chat. Put these things in the chat too, Trinity. Mm -hmm. You ever got access to the chat? Yes. Okay. So type at Miss Doc Jones in the chat. Clinician Fest. Follow us everywhere. Black Mental Health Awareness Matter. Black Mental Health Matters is really doing some dynamic things, and I am loving, 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 loving how far the reach is how far the reach is. That's important, okay? Because we're not just speaking from an African-American perspective. Remember, we're a diverse group, all right? So if you're black, you're, you're black, I'm identified, I'm identified as a black in um, Caribbean, the Caribbean, there's Central Caribbean, there's Southern Caribbean, there's Western Caribbean. So you are inclusive in all of this. And I want you guys to be intentional about helping us champion mental health first aid in the black community. Okay, and I want you also to be comfortable saying black. Capitalize yeah. that B. Capitalize that B. Black. Okay. I don't know why people think black is a, a bad word. To, that like, is not a derogatory statement. Yeah. Don't call people African American because they might not be African American. Just say black. Black. Yep. Black is okay. Black is okay. All right. Um, Depending on how you say it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Depending on how you're saying it. Watch your mouth now. Watch your mouth. Right. Right. Watch, Watch your mouth. <laughs> But black is not a derogatory statement to my black to my blacks in the room. But that B must be capitalized. Yes, please capitalize it. Um, and you can follow me on my YouTube platform. I am turning my channel into more of a mental health uh, safe space. I am at uh, Trinity Amanda. And I just want to thank everybody today for viewing. If you left comments, thank you so much. Thank you for viewing. And I just want to thank you so much, Dr. Jones, for being my first podcast guest. Well, um, well. <laughs> and I just, yes, I had such a great time. I hope everybody had a great time viewing this. I hope you learned something, you know, whatever you take away from this video is what you take away. So thank you for watching and we will see you next Saturday. All right, you guys be well and prosper. Capitalize that B. Take well. <laughs> Bye everybody.